Oh, those are the words of the 46th president of the United States at the inauguration today, Joe Biden. Oh, what a thrill it is for us to welcome our brother, esteemed author, broadcaster, professor, great mind. We're not going to mention the Steelers thing right now. We'll get to that later. But uh, the one and only Professor Eddie Globe Jr. And uh, Professor, uh, we, we've talked off the top about our feelings watching this unfold today and even the way we woke up this morning, how we felt. Uh, how about you? How did you uh, process everything that happened today? You know, to put it in the language of uh, my great grandmother, I was I was happy to see the back of Donald Trump's head. So that's the first thing. <laughs> um, but you know, this is a you know we have we we have we've had two rituals I think that are really important for for at least orienting us to what what we have to do moving forward. And one was last night, you know, which was a national ritual of mourning where there was finally a kind of national recognition of, of 400,000 dead, uh, that people have lost their loved ones. And, and for a moment, you know, uh, this, we, we were able to pull that grief from the privacy of one's heart into a kind of shared grief. Um, and that was important. So now, you know, as I said last night, um, as I was talking to others that, you know, folks didn't die right. And when folks don't die right, they haunt. And so that was really important. And then today, you know, this is this kind of American ritual and it, it, it's full of sentimentality. It has uh, a lot of spectacle involved in terms of the trans peaceful transition of power. But we have a shift from the kind of moment of Donald Trump to this, this moment of possibility. And I think the language that Joe Biden used that we stand, we're in a time, a winter of peril and a time of, of of, of uh, significant possibilities. And so um, I think we're, we're, those two rituals matter for at least setting us towards the right path. But we got a long way to go, Doc, long way to go. So um, I, nowhere near <laughs> my, in my wildest dreams, the caliber of, uh, of writer that you are, sir. So I'm, I'm going to ask you this as a, as a, as a peer of hers, uh, so to speak, in, in, that, in that pantheon of, of brilliance. Uh, Amanda Gorman, I mean, just did, did she knock your socks off or what today, man? I oh, mean, what did you think oh of, my of, of how she God. put it down? Yeah, it was extraordinary. Just 22 years old, first of all. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just just. But the poem is actually even more amazing on paper when mm -hmm. you can actually look at the wordplay. She's signifying throughout. There's a way in which she's holding back a kind of an American exceptionalism, even as she's inhabiting the language. There's a way in which she's bringing the fullness of our tradition to bear on this moment as she's imagining a different future. It was our genius. It was her genius on full display. I would urge everyone to go and read it from, from beginning to end. Uh, and the yeah. formal innovations, oh, my God, Maya Angelou was up there smiling, a big I'm smile. And, and, and Gwendolyn Brooks and a whole host yes. of our... Uh, saints were just smiling a big smile as she read her poem today. Yeah, no, we'll be, we'll be, that will be read and we will be reading that for forever. You know, I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's, and that's 20, that's nothing but an anointing. 22 years old to be able to meet that moment and to give us what yeah, we need to hear in this moment. I mean, this, that's, that's, oh my God, incredible. incredible. You know, there's nothing about, there's nothing more powerful than black excellence and eloquence and elegance in a moment of crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, you remember the late Stuart Scott said, we're cool as the other side of the pillow. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a translation of a certain kind of black elegant elegance and eloquence and excellence in the face of disaster. That's what that's what it means to listen to Lester Young's horn. You know what I mean? But anyway, we, I'm going on and on. She was amazing. Oh, she was amazing. Uh oh, uh oh, oh we, got, hey, we can talk about Lester Young, too. OK, this is this could be fun. Um, but, you know, speaking of, of black excellence and eloquence, uh, we didn't hear from her today, but we saw her, uh, Kamala Harris, next vice president, the vice president uh, of the United States, went to school right down the street at Howard University, uh, a member of the Lynx. I mean, just like so many, uh, just so many connections. You talk about uh, the culture and our experience. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? And is it 
beyond symbolism. I mean, can she, I know vice presidents don't always get in there and, and do policy above the people that they're working with, but do you see her being able to uh, go into this, uh, this political arena and get some things done? Oh, Michael, she will be one of the most powerful vice presidents we've had in history. Has a lot to do with the 50-50 split in the Senate. Um, so she's going to be making some serious decisions. She actually knows how the Senate works in ways in its recent iteration in the Mitch McConnell era more than Joe Biden does. Um, she, will, she will have a, a very, very powerful place uh, in the Biden administration, I think, uh, beyond just simply symbolic, rep you know, symbolic representation. Um, it is important, I think, that, you know, not only Howard, but not only the Lynx and Alpha Kappa Alpha, you know, she brings a cloud of witnesses with her. I'm thinking about those Atlanta washerwomen, those black washerwomen in the late 19th century who went on strike, uh, who thought because they needed, they needed livable wages. I'm thinking about Fannie Lou Hamer uh, from Mississippi. I'm thinking about Ella Baker. I'm thinking about Shirley Chisholm. I'm thinking about all those sisters, Joanne Robbins, we can keep going on and on. All of those sisters who have been fighting in light of double jeopardy, the experience of racism and the experience of sexism, having to deal with white supremacy and having to deal with patriarchy. She brings that cloud of witnesses with her, but we must understand that symbolic representation only takes us so far. We've been there and done that. We did that in 2008. It's important we got a sister in office, but the hell that black people are catching, the hell that vulnerable people are catching, move goes beyond the symbol. We need substantive policy to respond to the scale of the crisis we're facing. So we can celebrate today. We can celebrate the, the significance of her, 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 uh, her election, uh, the fact that she's now the vice president. But tomorrow is a different story. We're going to see what they do. And that's, that's what we need to be judging and measuring her by, what they do. Not for nothing, you win the library backdrop. Like, I mean, everybody does the library, but yours is always, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm fascinated most by yours, but over your right shoulder is mm. uh, a collection of essays to shape a new world, essays on uh, the political philosophy of, of, of Dr. King. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, this just, this just came to me to ask you, so I may not sure. ask it clearly, but I know you'll take it and you will run with it. Um, this, this Martin Luther King holiday this 35th edition of, of the federal holiday uh, for mm. Dr. King on Monday. In this moment, there was a different weight or vibe, significance, tension, whatever you want to call it around it. So when you combine what occurred at the Capitol on January 6th and, and this MLK day and today, like what's the, what's the, what's the through line? I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to find it, Doc. Like something about... The, the, you know, MLK Day on Monday and, and the conversations we were having on Monday and now today and Kamala Harris and all of it. Like, how do you how do you pull all that together? Am, am I am I reaching or is there something? No, no, not at all. About, I, yeah. You know, Mike, I'm thinking about um, I've been to the mountaintop speech, right? Mm -hmm. The speech that we're we're always quoting, you know, I, I don't know what's what will happen now. You know, I've seen the promised land and. and I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. But you know, we often run past that sentence that precedes it. And that is, we got some difficult days ahead, right? We've got some difficult days ahead. What we saw on January 6th was uh, a white mob, mostly white mob, sack the Capitol in the name of the world, of a world that Dr. King sought to destroy. That's what we saw. And today, what we've witnessed is another kind of shattering of a ceiling that he sacrificed his life in part for. But the end goal, what Dr. King was fighting for and many people around him were fighting for, was a more just world for the most vulnerable. But remember, he was organizing with garbage workers, the least of these. Uh, mm -hmm. understanding what it meant for, for those to be poor who lived in the richest country in the history of the world. So the pop and circumstance is one thing. But, you know, he was ready to pitch a tent city in Washington, D.C. He was ready to stage 
uh, a massive sit in to lock up sit in to lock up that city in the name of the poor. So we can't trade one fantasy, Donald Trump, for another fantasy, Biden and Harris. Politicians inevitably disappoint. We need to understand that. We've got some difficult days ahead. And we need to gather ourselves and prepare for that. Um, and today is just only one moment. It's what we, what we do tomorrow, starting tomorrow, that actually matters to me. You know, and, and you mentioned that, you know, starting tomorrow. And I, I was trying to get into this with Mike. Uh, mm -hmm. of just the willingness of people who don't agree with you, not just who don't look like you, that's a big part of it, but who don't agree with you philosophically and may not even uh, agree with you on what is true and what is not. I, I know with, with, your, with your roles, with your jobs, you have to talk to people like that. You know, some of them are your students, some of them are your colleagues. How have you found those conversations? That, that, that's going to be an inspiration to somebody because some people say, I just don't know how to do it. And at times, I say it myself, I don't know how to do it. I have. Uh, it's frustrating. But how do, you, how do you navigate that, that challenge from Joe Biden? We're trying to figure out if it's even realistic or not. I think we need to make a distinction, right? There, there are folks who can disagree with you, but they still agree with the broader frame of delibera democratic deliberation. We can have a disagreement in ideas, um, and, and we can fight it out. For example, you might think that um, the way to resolve, you know, uh, income inequality uh, would be uh, rooted in uh, private markets. I may think that central government might have a role in regulating markets, right? And we can have a disagreement about that. But then there are folks who may, in the course of their disagreement, reveal that they have a fundamental disdain for my humanity that they might not even agree with the frame. So let me make it a little less abstract. So there are folks who disagree about the approach uh, that we might take to, to addressing problems we face as a nation. And then there are folks who just simply don't agree with democracy. They, are, mm -hmm. they, don't, they believe this nation should be a white nation in the vein of old Europe, and the rest of us should sit down and shut up and just be grateful and, and, yeah. and occupy a second-class status. During, just give you a sense. I just want to give you this sense. During the inauguration, while I'm commenting in real time on Peacock, this streaming network, right? I'm getting mm -hmm. emails. I got an email. You are a demonic, worthless piece of trash. Don't be concerned. I don't hate you or wish death on you any more than you do on me. That being said, I will pray for a horrid, violent, painful, and very public death for you, right? You are the problem. I don't hate you because you're black. I hate you because you are a racist, bigoted, worthless black blob that instigates hate. You invite hate, and when you get it, you scream racism. What a disgusting piece of crap. Remember, we want a painful, violent death. Now, Joe Biden, what are you asking me to do to talk to him? Who, what God is that person praying to is what I want to know. Come on. But you, you hear that's now, a, but, that's but, a, that's a, that, they, they probably consider themselves a Christian. Of course. Call them you demonic. But, exactly. But, Mike, what, what are you asking me to do to talk with that person? What are you asking us to compromise? So yeah. when we have a talk of unity, we need to be clear yeah. about who we're talking about. We're not talking about that fringe who would, are willing to throw away American democracy, who are willing to call your life and my life into question, to deny you and me dignity and standing. There is nothing redeemable about that position. Nothing. And so part of my claim is this, is that if we're going to move forward, this country has to root that out of its body politic. There is no compromising with that. We did it before, and we had to bear the brunt of it. C. Van Woodward put it perfectly, perfectly clear in the strange career of Jim Crow. White, you know, white America had a falling out over race. Black folk gained their rights through a falling out among white men. Now they stand to lose it through a reconciliation 
of white men, and we've had to bear the burden of it. I'm not going through that again. So don't ask for unity on our backs again. There's nothing we can do to compromise with that. So the short answer to your question, Mike, when I'm disagreeing with somebody who fundamentally just has a different, have a different position than me, then we can have yeah. it out. We can, but if you deny me dignity and standing, I have no interest in talking to you. Yeah. Because I'm not going to put that <laughs> in question. Next. Right. I'm, I'm, listen, man, <laughs> I've, been, I've been saying, you know, I, I've been over the conversation, the conversation, capital T, capital C, for a long time because our humanity ain't up for discussion. You know, like it, 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 that's not that there's no opinion about brutalizing black people or there's no there's no opinion about white supremacy. You know, no, I, I that, you know, there's this wonderful <laughs> that, moment. That, that email, man, that's that's I, I, I know you get that all the time. I know you get that all the time. That's, you know, wait, Mike, we're not hearing you. That's not like a random they thought out exactly. There you go. There you go. It had a it had a beginning. It had a middle. Yeah. It had an end. They thought that out. Yeah. And they sent it, yeah. they sent it in the middle of yes. the inauguration. And I got three, four, five, six of them back to back to back to back. Just while like that. I'm talking. Yeah. While I'm yeah. talking. Yeah. While I'm talking. Yeah. 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 But you know, I want to say this, use this historical example really quickly. Yeah. In no, 1829. Take your time. In 1829. No, no. Like we say, take your time, Doc. <laughs> take yeah, your take time. your time, preacher. Take your time. Don't, don't, don't as I close on us. <laughs> as I hurry to but my seat. <laughs> you know, in 1829, David Walker published David Walker's Appeal. And it's an extraordinary pa uh, 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 pamphlet. Uh, cat out of Boston, writes this appeal. It makes its way into the slaveholding states. And many people believe it's the source of many black insurrections within the South. Now, Turner's a whole range of things, right? But David Walker is responding to Thomas Jefferson's notes in his appeal. In the notes from the state of Virginia, that's the first time in US literature that you have a writer reflecting on the page whether or not black folk are biologically inferior. Now, David Walker's appeal responds to that argument, not by engaging in a reasoned defense of who we are, of our humanity. He basically calls Jefferson a devil and said, how can you not think we don't hate you when you treat us like dogs? So he doesn't respond to Jefferson's claim about our humanity. He dismisses Jefferson, goes at him, Right? So part of what I'm saying is I don't want to give credence to any claim that denies mm -hmm. the standing of black folk. That goes all the way yeah. back to 1829. We don't need to do that. And I don't want to compromise with them. So Joe Biden, Democratic Party, even Jim Clyburn, even Kamala, whomever is talking about unity, if that presupposes that we have to make peace with people who don't believe we have equal standing in this country, the price of that ticket has been paid. We're not doing that no more. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how you can. Uh, even as, as, you know, Doc, even as a historical argument, I mean, like, for people who love the Supreme Court, I always said this, if you love the Supreme Court, and obviously Donald Trump did, you know, stack the Supreme Court and get the kind of uh, judges on there that he wants, if mm -hmm. you love the Supreme Court, then... Why not look at the history of the Supreme Court? The history of the Supreme Court tells you all about racism, doesn't it? I mean, it's right there. If you're going to value it in 2020 and 2021, shouldn't you value the history to kind of acknowledge the history of this country and where we are, how we got to this position? It's right there. It's in a legal right. argument. Right there. I mean, you can do you can trace the history of race in this country just by looking at immigration law. Just looking at the first naturalization act up to, I mean, we know this is a longstanding debate, right? Um, you can you can look at jurisprudence around race and see it. But you know, we know we're in trouble. On Martin Luther King's day, on, on MLK Day, they released the 1776 commission report. How about that? Mindless drivel. Mindless <laughs> drivel. That's all it was. So this is where yeah. we are. So today represents a moment, an inflection point an announcement of a certain set of values. But we got to, we, tomorrow, the fight, 74 plus million. 
-hmm. We got we got a we have a major battle on our hands, y'all. And that's just on the outside. Rip, rip. Biden's preach. I was gonna say. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael. Right, right, right before uh, we make fun of of the professor, because we got something. <laughs> like, we we got some you know accounting to take care of. But before we do that, I just want to say you and and Mike reference the book behind you. There's a book behind you by Cornell West. I got to tell you, uh, you yeah. and, and Dr. West are so inspiring to young men. I mean, really, I, I, this is not an exaggeration. When I first moved to Boston, I'd say within two weeks, I saw Cornell West. I'd never seen Cornell West speak before. He was speaking um, at the African Meeting House in Boston. Blew my mind, a brother quoting Curtis Mayfield, and then coming back and quoting uh, James Baldwin and, you know, Kirk going Jones. all around. I said, okay, <laughs> all right. This is what I'm talking about. But you know, really, I think we talk a lot about uh, inspirations, uh, whether they're musical inspirations or uh, professional athletes. But whether you realize it or not, you, you're doing you're doing something for somebody. And I just want to acknowledge it publicly. Well, you know, I want to just say to, to, to you that I'm Cornell West's student and I will always be his student. He found me. Um, he, he, he gave me the space to become the intellectual that I am. And so I'm just trying to live up to the to the example that he showed me over these many years. He's the godfather of my baby. That's how mm. close Cornell and I are partners, bro. And and so this is uh, generational. <laughs> Not partners, partners. Generational. <laughs> That's partners. right. Exactly. And you get the depth partners, of it. Yeah. Partners. Yeah. The yeah, depth of it. Absolutely. So I appreciate that, man. And, and, and he yeah, made no, his point. I, then pulled out the pocket watch <laughs> <laughs> with the three piece suit. <laughs> No, great. I, I was uh, I was just going to ask a, a follow up on the the conversation about unity though, um, mm. because we're talking we're we're talking about the, you know the out the seventy four million you, you referenced, Doc uh, Professor. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to say, do you think though we have to root out? How, what about the, the the job of rooting out the representatives of those seventy four million who adhere to that same ideology within the halls of of Congress? You know, within you know the, the the federal government, because I feel like I mean, while while Joe Biden is imploring Americans to come together, like yo, we'll, we we got we got to take care of this on the outside, but on the inside, I think he thinks that his career, his relationships, uh, will allow him to unify on a on a government on a policy level. How realistic do you think that is? You're right; it's unrealistic to negotiate with these terrorists on the outside, but their mm -hmm. leaders are still on the inside. So what right. about that part of the job? Right. So I think, you know, one of the couple of things I think that's really important, a couple of things about his speech that I think we need to kind of mark. One, he says, you know, we need to understand that the dream of justice uh, uh, for all should, will no longer be deferred. Boom. That's important. He used language of white supremacy and racism. Important. He also said he talked about truth and lies, and he used this formulation that lies have been told uh, in pursuit of power and profit. He didn't say in pursuit, but he says lies have been told for profit and po power and profit. So he's not only in that moment referencing Fox News and Owen and Newsmax and all of those folks, he's also mm -hmm. referencing, you know, the Hollies, the Ted Cruz's, uh, the Jim Jordans, right? Those folk who really are, who are they? These are the elected officials from the Tea Party that all of these folks said were in some ways just economically insecure white people and they weren't racist and body blah, and they revealed who they are. And so there's been a call, um, whether you, you know, Steve Schmidt and that crew gave us Sarah Palin and they're doing their penance now, but they mm -hmm. are calling <laughs> for these folk to be expelled from the Senate and the House. So there, there, there's some space, I think, Michael, for holding those folks accountable. Um, mm -hmm. I think there has to be a concerted effort, not only through the Department of Justice and Merrick Garland uh, and, and the directing the FBI, but also through Congress. We have to root out white supremacy, the Proud Boys, the Boogaloo Boys. We have to root out white supremacy in law enforcement. We have to get the extremists out of our body politic. We have to do that, and we have to do that thoroughly, finally, for once. And we also have to get rid of 
this form of politics that exploits that for its own gain, mm -hmm. that's going to require a different kind of reckoning. Because that's mm. not just Trump. That's Ronald Reagan, Doc. Yeah. That's mm. not that's yeah. not just Trump. That's the yeah. Republican Party, Doc. Yeah. They've how been about, they've been about, pimp how... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, you no, you I you said they, what? What are you about to say? No, they've been pimping white grievance and white resentment and white hatred for a long, long time. That's what I was gonna say. Yes, sir. No, I'm I, I'm sorry to, to step on you there. No, I was just gonna say like I was still looking at the Dr. King uh you know book of, or, or on your other shoulder over your shoulder. Like have that same energy when it comes to rooting out white supremacy that you had when it came to uh tracking the movements and the conversations for Dr. King when it when it when it came to conspiring to kill him. Have that same energy when it from from a, from a federal government standpoint, from a from a law enforcement standpoint that you had with him and the Black Panthers and everybody else. Uh, that you thought were the bigger threats to our society. I like, I like to see them apply yeah. that same type of pressure here. So exactly, anyway. exactly. Um, yes. Yeah. Sir. All right. Now so, you got. Now you got to take your medicine. <laughs> now go ahead. Go ahead. So what? what <laughs> hey, the coach. The coach of the Steelers said, "This uh, you love this. You love this phraseology." He said, "We are a ball club that died on the vine." <laughs> <laughs> Bruh. Uh, <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> Woo. That's nice. I said we folded like wet tissue paper. <laughs> you know, it was <laughs> it was an ugly collapse, but it also revealed, you know, in some ways, uh, you know that 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 what what what's really at we you know we Ben is at the end of his career. Uh, the defense is what it is, uh, to quote the late Denny Green, right? <laughs> to, to paraphrase <laughs> him at least, um, and so. Uh, my Steelers proved that they were uh, paper mache, and 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 I'm looking at these Browns, and they proved that they're the up and coming team uh, in that division. They showed a lot of grit um, uh, in in the playoff game against Kansas City, uh, but you know, it might be time to see. Uh, I don't want to equate the two, but it might be a good time to see the back of Ben Roethlisberger's head. Let him go on <laughs> off into the sunset. <laughs> oh, uh, wow. I mean. You know, because because that's the at that position. I mean, let, let's let's call it what it is. If you look at that division, y'all have the least stable slash desirable quarterback situation. Like I, I would take I would take the Bengals if you if you offer me right now between Ben and Joe Burrow, I don't think it's a question. I don't think that's a debate. So you got Lamar, you Baker, got Baker, you got how about Burrow. Baker? You take Baker over I take Ben? Burrow, I take I would take Baker over Ben right now. Yeah, at, right now. At absolutely. this point, when you think about and look, look, I'm 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 a I'm a Steelers fan. And I want to be very clear. I'm very, I support, I don't even want to use that verb. I understand who Ben Roethlisberger is, right? If he, was, if he had been a black quarterback in the NFL, he wouldn't be in the NFL right now. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's a different kind of conversation we could have, uh, given the off the field questions that, that have emerged around it, right? But I think, you know, just, at, just, just from an assessment of talent, I think it's important for us to say that Ben is, there's, you know, there's no more upside. He's on the he's on the other end of that hill, and you know we know what happens when we wait too long uh, to begin to look to look to look for the future towards the future, and we see the other teams in the division already looking for the towards the future in that or they're already in the future in, at that position. If that makes sense, does that make sense? Or am I totally. out of my oh, I'm no, out of no, my no, depth with y'all? No, I'm no, scared. no, no. I'm listen, that's right. You're right. Just 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 do us a favor. Just do us a favor. Just stick. To African American studies, stick, stick to American history, stick to politics, because we don't need you over here Come rooting on, us out. You know what I mean? Yeah, like we, we don't, we, we don't. You know what I'm right. saying? Because we know if you decided to talk sports, there'd be no need for us. You yeah, know? just keep that low, man. Keep that low. That's just our little thing we do here. Just yeah, keep it here. Let us have that, okay. at least. I've, I've been so, I've been so amazed. You're, I'm so giddy every time. You know, this is the second time, and I'm so giddy to be on the show with you guys and just. To be able to chop oh, it up and please. talk with you, you know, because y'all have y'all have I've been watching you for a long time. So this is beautiful, man. Oh no. Well, we it's appreciate you. all hours. And, and thanks for coming on. Us. Yes. And, and thanks for the book. For thanks for the day. signed copy. And the book. Yes. The signed copies I, of the book. I, yes, sir. Thank you. We got Some up people to the word, say right? they'll send you a book. A lot of people don't yeah, follow right. up. Doc followed up. Uh, I said, whoa. whoa. <laughs> This well, is wait, great. Wait, well, Michael, is a problem. Well, Michael, he Michael, he didn't ask, I don't think, but did you send him yours? You need, I mean, you know, you never know. He might put it. He might put it behind him, right next to Dr. King. Might be Patriot Rain next to Dr. King. 
you see, listen, you send me your address, I'm gonna send you a signed copy. I'm gonna, I, I will do that. I got you. Look at that. I, I got you. <laughs> Look at, you see your boy? He got you. He got you back. That's yeah. the way it's supposed to you be. Know. You know, Absolutely. I'm over here. I'm just, I, I dream about writing books. Maybe one day, you know, I'm just, I'm just pleasure to be wait. in your company. <laughs> I can't wait. Hey, Professor, thank you so much. Uh, God bless you. Thank Keep you. We appreciate fight, you. Man. And uh, thank you for sharing. Thank you for enlightening us. We appreciate you. Thank y'all. And y'all stay safe out here, okay? Take care. You too. Yeah, All you right. too. Talk to you soon. Hey, thanks for watching Brother From Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time on Peacock. Appreciate you.